Finally, a retirement calculator that might help you retire. Am I on track for retirement? It's a simple question. But to answer it accurately and make sure you don't outlive your money, you need powerful data and high-level math. And, even then, a leap of faith. Online retirement calculators usually make just enough assumptions to be dangerous. What if you live 10 years longer than you planned for? What if the market tanks? What if you need astronomically expensive round-the-clock health care? The answer you typically get from financial advisors is to save as much as possible, or way more than you could ever spend and hope for the best. The result is workers scared to retire and retirees terrified to spend a dime on anything fun or frivolous. Now comes United Income, a new money manager backed by some of the biggest names in retirement, pitching big data as a solution. It's deploying huge sets of stats on investment performance, retiree spending, longevity, and other crucial factors to simulate innumerable outcomes. The software estimates the chances that each client's personalized retirement strategy will actually succeed, then refines the plan if it won't. Based on as many as 18 million simulations per client, UI said. The aim is to make retirees' money go a lot further than other planning software which founder and CEO Matt Fellows scorns as hopelessly out of date. We've invented a new approach to money management, Fellows said in an interview. That may sound familiar, but Fellows, 42, has some street grid. A member of the family that owns Fellows Brands, a 100-year-old conglomerate, he's a former Brookings Institution scholar. In 2009, he started Hello Wallet which companies hire to give financial help to employees. Morningstar Incorporated acquired it in 2014 for $52.5 million, and Fellows became the investment research giant's chief innovation officer. Now, Morningstar is helping to back United Income, with more than a third of the $5.8 million raised so far. The new firm officially opens to investors today. It's a bet on Matt and that he can build an exceptional team to tackle a really difficult investor problem, said Joe Mansueto, Morningstar's founder and chairman. It's a business opportunity, but it's also a way to improve the retirement of millions of Americans. Basic retirement calculators just do math, estimating how money might grow over time. The more sophisticated calculators use historical market data to game out the best and worst case scenarios for investment performance. United Income does that too, but Fellows stresses the many future life outcomes and models. By focusing on investing, he argues, other firms ignore the two most important questions in retirement, when are you going to die, and how much are you going to spend before you do. To get the answers, United Income, whose 18 full-time employees are based in Washington, D.C., got advice from prominent people in policy and investing circles. J. Mark Erie a key architect of retirement policy in the Obama administration, is listed as an advisor, along with Stephen Utkus, director of Vanguard Group's Center for Investor Research, John Wider, a former president and CEO of AARP Services, a wing of the retiree organization, and several other former government officials. Health, exercise, and, increasingly, education and socioeconomic status can help predict how long we live. Even as the average American's longevity has stalled, there are affluent, well-educated fitness freaks who should probably plan on hitting 100. United Income asks clients about these factors and then uses detailed actuarial tables to estimate longevity. It does the same for spending, tapping government data to plot out how people might actually consume over the course of their retirements. Everybody's spending curve is different, Fellows said. Spending on essentials tends to stay the same throughout retirement and may even decline. For example, if retirees pay off their mortgages. But discretionary spending, such as tourism, tends to spike at the beginning of retirement. Healthcare spending, though essential is usually concentrated at the end. Your spending pattern is further affected by your marital status, financial situation, health, and other factors. United Income crunches all these data and makes recommendations. It gives advice on the best times to take social security payouts and make taxable retirement account withdrawals, and builds and manages custom investment portfolios using low-cost exchange-traded funds. The key to making nest eggs go further, Fellows said is an automated, 
sophisticated investing strategy based on each client's estimated requirements. For example, your essentials, such as utilities, groceries, and mortgage payments, must be covered with ultra-safe sources of income such as social security, pension payments, annuities, or conservative, bond-heavy investments that lets you take more risk, and in theory get higher returns, with money you've set aside for other goals, which clients can customize. Money for an around-the-world trip might go in an aggressively risky, equity-heavy portfolio. The strategy for a granddaughter's college fund will depend on how soon the girl graduates from high school. Money for major health care expenses, which often occur later in retirement, can start out in risky investments and move to safer ones over time. It might not sound like rocket science, but many advisors still base their strategies on basic rules of thumb guessing at a client's longevity or relying on averages to estimate spending needs. A common method is to predict spending based on a percentage of pre-retirement income, like 80%. All those rules of thumb made sense in a world that could not personalize data, Fellows said. They just don't make sense anymore. As a result, he said, retirees are often told to invest too conservatively. A 70-year-old with a modest lifestyle might have almost all her essentials covered by social security or a guaranteed pension, that gives her lots of freedom to invest aggressively, to build up a fund for late-in-life health care, and even to splurge on the occasional luxury. United Income's approach could be a big step forward in retirement planning, if its models work. The challenge is execution, Mansueto said. Fellows has got great ideas, but there's a reason that it hasn't been solved yet. United Income will have to get every detail right. Its main target is people between 55 and 70 with $300,000 to $3 million to invest. A plan that succeeds for these clients 9 times out of 10 will still fail an unacceptable number of people. When you're giving investment advice, the guiding principle is did no harm, said Anthony Webb research director at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School for Social Research. Webb hasn't reviewed United Income's methodology but warns of the difficulty of creating customized retirement plans that work for everyone. You can try to estimate a client's longevity, for instance, but even with major health problems he or she still has a small chance of living to a very old age. You have to hedge that risk he said. One way is to recommend insurance products. United Income doesn't but is exploring adding simple annuities and deferred annuities, also known as longevity insurance, to its platform. Clients can monitor their plan's risk of failing in real time. When they log on, they're greeted by a meter gauging our confidence that this plan will succeed and told how many of their spending goals are still on track. Don't expect that confidence number to waver much, though, Fellows said. Even if the stock market plunges 20% in one day, the calculations are based on all the factors that go into UI's models, spread out over the rest of a client's life. United Income charges an annual fee of 0.5 to 0.8% of assets, depending on the level of service clients want and how much money they invest. UI also offers a financial plan and social security advice for free. It also keeps track of cash and investments held with other institutions and takes those assets into account when making recommendations. Ahead of its official launch, United Income said it has collected more than $200 million in assets since late July. Why haven't more financial firms amped up the data piece of their retirement planning tools this much? It's hard for younger workers preparing for retirement. Everyone's goal is pretty much the same to save and invest as much as they can. But after age 55, the standard advice doesn't work as well and subjective measures matter more. How much do you like your job, and how secure is it? Where do you want to live? How's your health? Another reason many retirees don't get sophisticated advice. Lots of firms try hard to sell clients a mutual fund or an annuity to reap a commission but after the sale is complete they're much less interested in their day-to-day -day money management needs. That gives United Income an opportunity, if clients find its advice valuable. And that could put even more pressure on the nation's incumbent financial advisors, already facing rapid change and increasingly demanding clients who have good reason to be skeptical of their advice. Diamond Beck's online fit calculator. When we poll you all on what vexes you most about your cycling, its contact point discomfort. Saddle, mostly, 
and your position. We've developed and deployed solutions for both, but they require you physically visiting and availing yourselves of tools and expertise. Those who patronize direct sellers of bikes, Canyon, Premier, Diamondback, may never experience the in-person solutions to which I allude. What Diamondback wanted was an online tool for folks who want to rely on the in-person experience. I'm going to describe here the math I proposed for that company. It's been deployed, with considerable coding skill, on the Andean Custom Studio, which is the cool configurator Diamondback uses to build your Andean. The online calculator shows up after the decisions you make on spec and color, but you can navigate directly to that calculator. Below is a miniaturized, to fit this article's column width, screenshot if part of the output when I subject myself to this prescriber. The results of this endeavor will determine whether my gaze exceeded my grasp. My goal was to prescribe with high granularity your pad's position, pad Y and X, to pad center, based solely on your overall height and your saddle height, from BB to the top of your saddle. 4 centimeters behind the nose, not the size of the frame, the exactly pad placement. Many of you on our reader forum helped me in this endeavor. I'm going to walk you through the hows and whys of this process because I'm going to predict something about this predictor. It's going to be a highly visited link on Diamondback's website out of sheer curiosity, and, rightly or wrong, as a fit tool. Whether or not a customer ends up buying a Diamondback bike, why overall height and saddle height? Why did I choose only these values, and why these particular values? First, I wanted this to be easy. Second, the fewer values I chose, the fewer the opportunities for an end user to make a mistake in measuring. As to why values, overall height needs no explaining and saddle height gave me a glimpse into your morphologies. Imagine two people six apostrophe too tall. 1880 millimeters. The rider with a saddle height of 780 millimeters is long in the torso, the rider with a saddle height of 830 millimeters is long in the leg. Why not just use inseam instead of saddle height? Because saddle height got me further down the road. It represents morphology plus pedaling action, whether you're toe pointer or heel dropper. And, because I now know your saddle height I can cross-reference your final pad position with what data I have on armrest elevation drop from the top of the saddle. Of course, this all assumes you can provide a good value for saddle height. If you input a bad number for saddle height everything the calculator spits out will be off. And, I mean try bike saddle height, not the Lehman formula, and I mean saddle height at the seat angle representing the modern consensus. An orthodox saddle position today on tri bikes is considerably forward of what you tried on your road bike. I asked a lot of slow switchers to help me with this. You gave me your saddle and overall heights, and I graphed the pad Y and X positions prescribed here versus the actual positions you ride. You can see where many of you end up in the chart above. There's a lot on that chart. Each data point represents the pad Y and X of about 100 slow switchers, blue diamonds and a bunch of pro athletes, red squares for men, green triangles for women. The arrows point to the positions the prescriber here generated for you based on your height and your saddle height and the numbers are pad Y and X respectively generated by the math in this diamondback prescriber. Note that you fit into a band. The deep green line is a slope that is the mean. The lighter green line is the range of allowable positions this prescriber generates based on the differences in morphologies. All slowed witchers using the diamondback fit calculator are going to fit inside the wider green band except duckies above, who was robbed of a torso at birth. Just notice that the blue dots are where you really ride, so either the calculator is telling you where you ought to ride, or it's tell you to ride in a place you're not capable of riding. Which is it? Good question. Let's talk more about it. The blue squares on the chart just above are the prescribed positions and they all sit in that narrow band I just wrote about. The green squares are where you really ride, if you participated in this exercise, the longer the line between those blue and green squares, the more the prescriber blew it, or, the more your position isn't orthodox and perhaps isn't optimized. Note these blue squares don't sit on a line but in a band, that faint pink band. On the center of that band sit the prescriptions you'd get if there were no consideration given for morphology. Those at the top of the band are leggy, those at the bottom of the ban are torsoy. The prescriber adheres to a fairly rigorous orthodoxy of position. It expects you all to ride alike one another, 
as if you were all goose stepping in sync in the army of a petty dictator. The only variance you're granted is for morphology, there is no consideration given for fitness, fatness, age, ardency, skills, or ambition. There is no I just want to finish button to click on this prescriber. Why? Because I haven't found any data to suggest finishers tend to select unambitious positions. What I have done, pay close attention to this, is give you the pro position. Remember those red dots, plus 20 millimeters of pad Y. I added some pad height to the pro position. That's your age group fudge factor. What this means is that if you truly want to race like a pro does, you want your position to be right where those red squares are representing the pro men, a couple of charts above, and you want to use this prescriber, use the numbers this prescriber outputs but choose the solution that allows the bars to be lowered by 20 mm to 30 mm. Variances between prescribed versus actual. As noted, the longer the line between a prescribed position versus the writer's actual position, the more our predictor and your position fail to match. What explains this? Could be several factors. I highlighted a forum user in the chart above with the greatest variance, with the username Lai. His position is just below. He's been in the A2 win ton aisle, having his position dialed. He writes fast. But you can see why his position varied considerably from that generated by Diamond Back's prescriber. Lai rides very steep, he rides very low, and the steepness pushes the pads out, and the lowness brings his pad Y down. I'm comfortable not producing a prescriber that prescribes Lai's position, because I don't think very many of you could or would want to ride his position, even if your overall and saddle heights are exactly Lai's. But is anything wrong with Lai's position? Not for Lai. Accordingly, what you see in the actual versus prescribed chart above is a lot of blue, prescribed squares inside that narrow band of orthodoxy and a lot of green, actual, squares sitting all over the place. That's slowage for you. Do I want your green squares to be closer to the blue squares? Half the time yes. Half the time number depends on the rider. Static versus dynamic fitting. And this is precisely why you should be going to Trent Nix, Ann Barnes, Matt Steinmetz, Ian Murray, John Blyer, J.T. Lyons, Matt Cole, Dean Sprague, or any of the truly good fitters around the country, I can give you the name of the right fitters in just about every U.S. region and every non-U.S. country. This is why your default decision should be to locate the right fitter with the right equipment in his fit studio. You may end up in a position like Lai, described above, and here's an image of him writing below. I'm not prepared to tell him to obey my prescriber and to change his position. Neither am I prepared to create math that tells you all to ride Lai's position. However, many of you just won't go, or don't have access, or lack the confidence and trust to patronize, to such a fitter. So here you go, Diamond Beck's tri-bike position prescriber. Just know that a proper analogy would be for me to prescribe your shoe size based on your overall height and the length of your ear from its top to the bottom of its lobe. Better just to avail yourself to a direct measurement of your foot, and of your bike position. Two parts to the fit process. What is the ambitious, and revolutionary, or foolhardy, depending on the critic, element to Diam and Beck's prescriber? It's that it engages directly on part one of the two-part fit process. Part two is the easiest, because it's simply a math problem. Looking at Diam and Beck's tool, it asks you if you already know your pad Y and X. You would know this if you are confident in your position and you simply measure the rise and run from the BB to pad center on your tri bike, or if you go to a fitter such as I list above. Part 1 of the process gives you your pad Y and X. There hasn't been a good process for this. Some will quip that there still isn't a good process for this. Nevertheless, this online tool is in my view significantly advanced over what came prior. Saddle position? Adjust to suit. Note that this prescriber outputs pad position, not saddle for, aft. What do you do with a saddle? With this prescriber, this system, this exercise, you place the pads where the prescriber tells you to and then move the saddle for, aft until it's comfortable. If the math in this prescriber is anything close to good, your hips should end up where I want them to be which is where the hips are versus the crown set, on the positions of the pro triathletes you see in the photo galleries on slow twitch. Yes, there are variances, 
including among the pros. How do I factor in those variances? I don't. I'm assuming you'll ride pretty much the way the main pro athlete rides, and I don't find that pro athletes ride steeper than age groupers who are properly fitted by a good fitter who owns the appropriate fit tooling. I only find that pros ride lower than age groupers and have normalized accordingly by adding 20 millimeters to pad heights when prescribing your position. Should you buy a bike based on this prescriber's recommendations? Number. Yes. It depends on the resources available to you, and your willingness to seek an alternate solution, i.e. to visit a good fitter. Would I use this prescriber? The prescriber works for me because I ride quite an orthodox tri position. The prescriber is going to miss the mark by only by so much and probably not by a whole frame size, maybe by a stem length, however, I wrote above that I believe this prescriber is vastly better, more accurate and more helpful than any online calculator for tri bikes, the others I've seen are either hopelessly bad or maddeningly imprecise, if you're buying a super bike and you're buying it online, or special order, such as a Trek speed concept via project 1, you need to make firm decisions on a proprietary stem. On where to miter the stirrer. On the pedestals you'll anticipate using. On how long the cables and housing should be using that stem and those pedestals. A direct or special order seller is going to send you what in the mail, if the only prescription given is frame size. What length will the cable housing be cut to? It seemed to me the only helpful prescriber needs to call its shot with precision, Otherwise what's the point? The Andean's prescriber will always give you three options, which may well include more than one frame size, and you must choose based on handling and adjustability. Revisiting my solution, above, I could be on an XL, but I would have very little room to move the pads back, or down. I prefer the size L and I prefer the stem length that gives me pads in the center, neutral, position. With this solution I can move to a different stem size if need be. I can move the pads fore and aft, and I can move the bars higher or lower. How will I am and back build the bikes, now that it has this prescriber? I don't know. My guess, and what I would counsel, is that they build the bike to match the solution you choose, adding a bit of extra cable and housing to accommodate an extra 20mm of height and 10mm of length, should you find the prescribed solution not quite high or long enough with a stirrer cut to allow an extra 20 mm or 30 mm of height, that much stirrer sticking up above the stem. For those who buy an Andean off this prescriber, how the complete bike is assembled is a question you'll want to ask. I suppose there are some couples who feel they divide household chores and childcare exactly 50-50 and are perfectly happy all the time and give each other foot massages every night. But for most people I know, Every day is a particularly exhausting combination of whack-a-mole, an obstacle course, and a flogging. And it can be difficult, while in the midst of the flogging, to not feel resentful if you think you're taking on more than your fair share. Enter Equally Shared Parenting, a website run by Mark and Amy Vachin, the authors of Equally Shared Parenting, rewriting the rules for a new generation of parents. They are, obviously, proponents of dividing the load equally and to that end they offer equality calculators, or worksheets for child care, housekeeping, breadwinning, and self-time, as well as a financial evaluation calculator. Now let me just say that these worksheets are certainly not meant to be weapons, bludgeons with which you can clobber your partner after she once again fails to remember that cleaning up after dinner also includes sweeping the kitchen. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? They are meant to be conversation facilitators and tools for discussing whether you're happy with how you divide the load, and how to adjust if you're not. My partner and I have two kids, ages 7 and 4, and we are constantly divvying up child care and paid work based on who has more paid work at any given moment. So I was curious. I printed out the child raising equality scale, and filled it out with either an equals for tasks shared equally and either an L or an F for the chores that each of us mostly takes on. Okay, fine. But this was not the precise mathematical breakdown of what each of us does, so I figured out a percentage for each task. Some things I do 100%. Some things he does 100%, others are split 80-20, 70-40, etc. Because I am not terrific at algebra and calculus and can't make a tidy equation, I figured out my overall percentage like this. I gave each task 100 points, 
and for each task that is relevant to us, 26 on the list, I came up with percentage that I am responsible for, I do 100% of seasonal close rotation, so that is worth 100 points for me, for example, but roughly 70% of play date coordination, worth 70 points for me. Then I added all the points up and divided by 2600, and found that I do 58% of the child care, by this model. Pretty fair. However, diapering and feeding are obviously sucky chores compared to buying birthday presents. My friend pointed out that some chores are worth more than others. Toilet training kids is vastly more effortful than shopping for gifts, for example, so he suggested assigning the more arduous chores a higher point value. So I will assign cleaning up bedwetting a greater number of points and present buying a smaller number of points. And now I'm geeking out on math puzzles while my partner is handcrafting paper dragons with the kids. We all have our strengths. Don't feel like working through a mathematical function with your partner. Use the worksheets the way they were intended to start a conversation about whether you're happy with your division of labor. And don't forget to sweep the floor.